Obviously, we have the Sermon on the Mount before us this morning. The blessing, no pun intended, is a curse that this is familiar to everyone. It's the first recorded sermon, if you will, by Jesus, and it's simultaneously short in length, but long in theology. The short passage that has been studied for centuries from theologians from the beginning to now, from Nativity Youth Camp to now, has been okay. uh, has been great. Rebecca Eggfund, professor and chair of theology at Loyola University, gives plenty of food for thought in her book, The Beatitudes Through the Ages, concerning the use and interpretation of the Beatitudes in ethical, political, and social justice contexts. Immediately in her chapter one, she poses the question, who are the Beatitudes for? And are they counterculture? Just to grab onto some of her questions and answers, it is, a subs- it is, is it a subset of Christians, such as ethicists, clergy, or those engaged in social ministries? Is it a model for the corporate church to follow? Is it for governments claiming to be Christian in tradition when making laws? Is it for all Christians? Is it, in fact, for everyone, Christian or not? But what piqued my curiosity is the question of the counterculture nature of the Beatitudes. Perhaps Professor Eklund reports the first to question this was, the, was John Chrysostom in the fourth century from his homilies on the Gospel of St. Matthew, that the things Christ blesses are so contrary to the accustomed ways of men, and I apologize, ladies, that's the way things were written in the fourth century, that they are the very things which all others avoid, and certainly not the last to consider the place of the Beatitudes was, was novelist Kurt Vonnegut when he pointed out that Christians often request that the Ten Commandments be posted in public rather than the Beatitudes. Vonnegut writes, Blessed are the merciful in a courtroom. Blessed are the peacemakers in the Pentagon. Give me a break. This could be enough for us to scratch our heads and move on to next Sunday's gospel in hope of buying another three years before the next Time this text comes around. But being the troublemaker that I am, I'm not letting us off that easy this morning. So let's take a look at the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes are hard because they seem to say that only those on the margins are going to see the rewards in the kingdom. This is reinforced when the rich man comes to Jesus to ask how he can enter the kingdom of God and is told to sell everything. Let's face it, that is threatening to those who hold authority, those who have even the smallest amount of wealth, and especially to those who have both great amounts of wealth and authority. And that goes for those in the wider church as well as secular society. It may even sound threatening to those hearing this who saved up for their retirement sitting here. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus leaves us a hanging curveball out over the plates on this one. Those who are paying attention, pitchers and catchers, in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> in what we pray is a post-COVID era, we either know someone who has lost their life to, to the pandemic or for any other reason, while we were left to try to grieve the most often alone. We may not be able to fathom that right now, but Jesus assures us of comfort to come. And mourning isn't just for those who have died. Mourning for lost relationships, lost opportunities, loss of employment, loss of health care, loss of a place to live, or any other loss. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek? 
Carpe diem, seize the day. Isn't that what we're taught? Or maybe, maybe my fav uh, favorite ad campaign slogan, "Die besta oder nix, the best or nothing. Being meek isn't how we get the best job or that promotion. Being meek isn't how we beat out the competition to land the big deal. Being meek isn't how we navigate the roads or shop for the toy at Christmas that everyone is trying to purchase those last days before Santa comes. Being meek is for losers, and how can losers inherit the earth? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. For those who have been part of any of the social justice ministries at this cathedral or other parishes you've attended, this is hope and maybe some comfort in what we do for the least of God's children. But it could be frightening to those who put up barriers to good works, for those who say, we need to do something to help those poor homeless people, but not in this neighborhood. Or those who see a hand up as a hand out to those struggling to feed themselves and their families, or to get treatment for even the simplest of medical needs. Many seem to have lost the idea that providing affordable, or better yet, free medical care only makes things better for everyone. Business owners would have healthier employees that miss less work or when they are sick for shorter periods of time. An increased production would be better than looking at it as being just too large to be effective on the bottom line. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Synonyms for mercy include blessing, forgiveness, grace, sympathy, tolerance, and generosity. Mercy may not just be in the court system, but it may happen when those on the margins of society, either by their identity or poverty, are treated with dignity and respect. While some things may cost us something to give, food, a bed, somewhere to get out of the cold, there are things that do not. A smile is the lowest cost thing we can give, and yet it may be the greatest gift one may receive that day. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Wow. Jesus throws up an impossible one here. Purity of heart, someone without a blemish on their soul, without sin. Maybe he should have started with this one, so I could have just stopped right there. Up until this, there was a glimmer of hope in attaining the earlier blessings. But we know that we are sinners, so not pure in heart. But what is Jesus trying to say here? How are we to get under heaven such an, under such an impossible standard? We don't know for sure, since this is all we have. Matthew leaves us without a way to reconcile our impurity with how we receive redemption. But 2,000 years of writers and theologians have been trying to answer that question. I don't have the answer, but I have some suggestions. Maybe it's through simply trying to improve ourselves, an attempt to cleanse our hearts as best we can while living an earthly life surrounded by temptation. We see this as the path in the baptismal covenant where we're asked, will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord, which we all answer, I will with God's help. Or perhaps it's simply the grace offered by God, a God who knows us and loves us for who we are without any qualifiers. That is a difficult answer for some to accept. How can God love me when I know who I am? Dietrich Bonhoeffer offered, offered up what he called costly grace, in that it is through the invitation of Christ that we enter into a place where God forgives us and loves us. Period. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I don't need to remind everyone that we seem to be getting further and further from maintaining any sort of peace today. Peacekeeping in the context of Matthew may be that of a mediator, someone who sees potential conflict and works to stop it before it happens. Conflict and war have taken on a different look since the American Civil War. 
Prior to that, war was mostly settled by small professional armies. What has still affected the civilian population, it was not the horror on the global scale seen during the 20th century. And while the 21st century conflict in Ukraine is smaller than the world wars of the last century, it could escalate into something larger. And the question looms, is it peacekeeping by sending tanks and potentially combat aircraft to the Ukraine? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. This country was settled by many fleeing Europe to escape both persecution and prosecution for their theological differences from the Roman Catholic Church and even from some of the Reformation churches established as the official state religion. I am descended from separatist Puritans, Quakers, and German Reformed dissenters arriving in the 17th and 18th century. This persecution can be seen in my own family history as when those who came over as Puritans decided to become Quakers in Massachusetts and were promptly asked to leave. Persecution can take a variety of shapes, from a level of shunning to losing one's life for standing up for one's religious convictions. It can take the form of those opposed to a homeless shelter, open to do what Jesus asks us to do, or someone working to prevent a shelter from being opened. So, after all this, it doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? The Beatitudes are much harder than they may first appear, and it seems that it is nearly impossible to attain anything on this list. With something so difficult, it's amazing that the crowd gathered around Jesus didn't just walk away. So what kept them following Jesus? For the people of this remote corner of the Roman Empire, Life under an oppressive occupation left them with no hope. The 21st century American ear hears a different list than the first century Judean who suffered under the Romans. So how can we look at it at today? Professor Eklund, in her concluding chapter, gives us her view. She says that she wants to make a case that the Beatitudes can only be can be known fully not by reading about them, but through seeing what they look like in human lives. Perhaps it's better to say not that the Beatitudes mean something, but that they hope to transform someone, that they aim to transform us. Amen.